Hi, it's Andy, and welcome to the Hills Church Podcast. Our hope is that this will help your life and inspire your faith. Thanks again for checking us out. Your pastors are, so, are special people. They live by faith. I mean, they truly trust God. You know, you don't always know who's leading you. You don't always know everything about them. Uh, you know a lot. He's very transparent. But let me tell you that the little stories that I've heard, and, and just to get to know your pastor, Andy, he loves the Lord, and he's living a life by faith. And uh, I'm thankful to know you guys. Honestly, we've, we've been, uh, we were down in uh, Southern Ireland uh, in November for our anniversary, and it was special. But when we got here, my wife said to me, I, I never want to go anywhere else. Like, I'm like, Really? Uh, yeah, this is where I want to go on vacation for our anniversary for the rest of my life. And I was like, you know, me too. I love this place. And we just tucked it away in our hearts. And then a few months ago, we saw a little conference uh, making a huge impact and uh, all through Europe. And we said, maybe we should come to that. I don't know. I get a text from a friend who invited me to that conference like three days later. Had no idea that we were praying about it. And we said, Lord, you're doing something in us for this amazing place. And so we are so thankful. We don't know what we're doing here. You know, if I could serve you in any way, if I could bless you any way, I would be so happy. I, I, it would just, my wife would be so happy. We're just honored to be here, honestly. And we don't know what we're doing. We're living by faith, too, right now. And I want to share with you just a little bit. But before I do, I want to show you a picture of my family. Um, the best part of me is my family. Uh, my wife, Jessica, in the middle. My daughter, she's 12 years old. Uh, her name is Adeline. And uh, she's just so full of life. She's super creative. Uh, she loves to cook. Uh, she, make, uh, she made creme brulee for my wife for her, uh, for her birthday um, and for Valentine's Day, rather. And she's only 12 years old. And creme brulee is one of, like, the hardest desserts to make. It's crazy, but she figured it out all on her own. Uh, she's beautiful. Um, my middle son, Hudson, uh, with uh, the necklace 29 on there, he's 16. He is, uh, he's an amazing kid. Uh, he's, he loves soccer. Can I call it? Will you let me call it soccer? Okay. He loves footy, uh, football, and he's played his whole life, but uh, he also loves worship. He loves the church. He loves the Lord. Uh, he plays the drums, and uh, he just, I mean, he's such a good kid. He's in uh, 10th grade. And then my oldest son, Reagan, he is a special kid. He's 19 years old. He's in college. He wants to become a, a therapist. He loves to help people, a psychologist. He, he just wants to help people's souls and minds. He loves the Lord. Uh, these, my boys, my daughter, my daughter was born when we planted the church in the theater. She was literally born the same year. My boys ha- helped. My, my son, Reagan, would come with me at 6 a.m. in the morning and set it up and stay till 1 o'clock and tear it down. My family is the best part of me, and they've helped, they've helped build the church. They've, they've been in all the way. Um, I live in Florida, right by the Space Center, uh, right by where SpaceX is, where the space shuttle used to go up back in the day. Now we don't have one anymore. Uh, we have Elon Musk. That's who helps us now. And uh, it's amazing. We'll see rockets every day. And when I talk to people about living in Florida, um, they always have questions about Florida. They're always wondering because Florida's always in the news where always something crazy is happening in Florida. And so I just thought I would tell you a Florida story, if that's okay. Um, Florida has hurricanes. Uh, do you, you guys don't have hurricanes here? No, okay. We have hurricanes, and uh, they're sometimes really big and scary and crazy. And uh, we had a hurricane a while back, and um, we decided to leave because the last hurricane that we stayed for, uh, it was kind of scary. We said, we don't want to be here for this hurricane. I'd rather the house get hit because we also have tornadoes in the hurricanes as well. Not just hurricanes, but in a tornado, there's a, there's a, or in a hurricane, there's a bunch of tornadoes that come through as well. So it's exciting, uh, but this is what it means to live in Florida. And so we board our whole house up. We get our generator ready in case the power goes out, and we leave, and we come back home, and uh, we're like, you know what? Uh, the house is safe. Everything's safe. And um, why don't we drive around and, and look for stuff, okay, and just see what's happening. But when I, when I came up to the house, and by the way, I thought some of my trees were going to fall over because I have a, a palm tree that is like uh, 30 feet in the air, really high in the air. It's really skinny. 
and uh, it looks like it's going to fall apart, honestly. It's just, you know, it, it literally is just like, uh, looks like woodpeckers have attacked it, and so we're thinking, I don't know if this is going to make it. And I get home, and the palm tree is still standing. And I thought, how in the world is this tree standing uh, through a hurricane, 100-mile-an-hour wind, just constantly blowing? But as I pull up to the house, I notice the tree is standing, but I also notice a gentleman uh, is sitting in the street with his truck, okay? He's got a pickup truck, and the wheel of his pickup truck has fallen off. And he's sitting in front of my house. And we have an oak tree. My, my neighbor has an oak tree as, a tree as well. And the oak tree had snapped and broken and landed on the front of his truck. And so uh, I'm thinking, what in the world happened? This guy is he's not from my neighborhood. you know, And he's sitting here with the wheel off in a hurricane with a tree laying on his hood. And I'm thinking, what has happened here? And... Um, so I asked the neighbors, what's going on? I asked him, he's like, I'm, he's trying to fix his wheel. He, 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 he looked like he was struggling a little bit, just generally speaking. And I'm like, do I need to help this guy? What do I need to do? And my neighbors tell me that at 2 a.m., he was driving through our neighborhood. And uh, they heard this big screeching where his wheel was starting to fall off his vehicle, uh, like the whole rim. And all of a sudden, it fell off. And they called the police. The police show up. And they're like, sir, what are you doing? It's 2 a.m. in the middle of a hurricane, literally 100-mile-an-hour wind. The police get there. They're trying to help him. And he says to the police, he says, um, I was driving around looking for generators to steal from the neighbors. And the police was like, really? You are? He's like, yeah. So obviously something's going on here, you know. And uh, my wheel fell off, and the tree snapped and landed on my truck, and now I'm stuck here. And I'm thinking, God, did you do that? You know, like, what, what's going on, right? And uh, here, <laughs> so, uh, this is what it means to live in Florida, right? Crazy things happen. But as I'm, as I'm telling you this story, the guy gets the help, the fire department helps him, he ends up leaving and going on. And I started thinking about these two trees. I started thinking about the oak tree that snapped and that broke and that fell on the truck. And I'm thinking about the palm tree that just stood up tall and mighty, as thin and as uh, sickly as this tree looked, it didn't break. And I started thinking about this today and what it kind of maybe would mean to each one of us is I want to be the palm tree in life. I want to be the one that is flexible, that follows the Holy Spirit, that when he says go, I bend and I don't break, I don't snap, that when the storms come, of life, the hurricanes, the trouble, the trauma, the drama, the pain in our family, the pain you might experience in your business, the pain in your marriage, the internal struggles that you go through in your mind, whatever those things might be, the struggles we see our kids and grandkids go through, that the storms of life can't knock us down either. And I was thinking about on Pentecost Sunday, how if we could be open to the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, we would say, move us. And you as a church, that you would say, God, if, you're meant, if we're meant to stay, Lord, we'll be flexible. And why would we be flexible? It's because we know that God has a plan, and it's better than our plan. Are you with me today? A man plans in his heart, but this church, the Lord, directs your steps. Amen? Amen. And so... That was not in my message, but I felt it was so important to share with you, the flexibility, because that's what it means to be a people of faith. Um, I live a very busy life. I have a very busy church. I have a very busy family. Right before Easter Sunday, we we're so busy. Do, any of y'all busy? It seems like you can't. You're always running around doing stuff. And even when you should be concentrating, you've got your phone in your hand, and you're answering emails, and you're answering texts, and you're going from thing to thing. And, and you know, that's what my life is like. And so here I am on a day. I'm literally, I've I'm, I'm got a one-hour meeting. I've got to get it all done. And I leave the meeting, and I have 15 minutes to get to work to record a video for the whole church. And I step out of my house, and I have three things I need to do on my phone while I'm talking in the car and, and just t having a meeting in the car as I'm going. And uh, I get in my car, and I start driving. I have five minutes to get to church. It seemed like busy, 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 busy. And I forgot 
my cell phone. And oh my gosh, if you, I, I thought my world was ending because my, my life was planned down to the literal minute at that point. And I can't turn around and go back. I got a case of nomophobia. Do you know what that is? That's the fear of missing your cell phone. That's a real problem for me, okay? I got nomophobia, and I started thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I did something. I took a second. Do you know what I mean? You take a second, and you say, God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I thought, I'm going to do nothing. I'm going to have some peace, and I'm going to drive to work. And I took a second, and the peace of God just came all over me in that moment, And I thought, how awesome is this to not have my phone? What a blessing to not be distracted right now. And I just drove all the way to work. And I think even when we come into church, sometimes it's just about taking a second and a deep breath. When you're in praise and worship and you're the beautiful band that was up here today, we all took a second and we took a breath. And did you not feel the presence of the Lord when the worship band was going? Like we take a second and peace falls all over us. And the Bible encourages us to take a second. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says this. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace. We have to take a second, don't we? And when we're running in our own strength, and we're, we're going 100 miles an hour. We're trying to fix it all. We're trying to figure it all out. The best thing that we can do is take a second and breathe. The thing I love about the Holy Spirit, the word spirit means breath, literal breath. When we take a second, we take a breath, and the peace of God will, that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds. And so as I start this message, I want to simply pray a prayer of blessing over each one of you today. As we study the word of God together, would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we pray? Father, I I pray, Lord, for your blessing upon this church, the hand of God upon your people. Lord, as you bless these people, Lord, the church would be blessed. God, I pray for supernatural miracles to enter their life. God, finances for this church to grow and become alive. This would be a supernaturally led church, and you would bring it to your people first. And it would go from your people to this community, to this church, from the church to the community, from the community to this nation, from this nation to the world. Lord, that you would increase their influence, God. That you are birthing something beautiful in this place, in each person. That their families would be touched. The people that we're longing for to find salvation. Lord, that you would touch this land through these people. Lord, that your Holy Spirit and your presence would be with each one of us in Jesus' name. And Lord, that you would protect us, God. Protect us from evil. Protect us from temptation. Protect us from the enemy. Protect us from fear and from lies that we might follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. If you agree with that prayer, just say amen. So this message is called Take a Second. Take a Second. And there's something about a second look. When you have a second look, if you know what I mean. The first look, you don't always see everything, right? But the second look, sometimes you see what you need to see. Um, there's a place in our, in our, where we live in Florida called Second Harvest Food Bank. Um, let's see. Yeah, Second Harvest Food Bank. Second Harvest Food Bank, what they do is they go to the grocery stores and they take the food that we're going to throw out and they give it a second chance. Before it goes bad and spoils, they put it in the freezers to, to protect it. And then our church and churches like ours can go get this food and we can give it out to people that really need it. If we, they didn't take a second look at this food, it would go into the trash. But because they don't do that and they give this food a second life, we get this food and our church alone feeds about 2,000 people every single week. People that are homeless, people that are hurting, people that are struggling, have lost their jobs. Right in my town in Florida, right by the Space Center, we, we see 600 cars that will pull in and people walking up and we give them grocery bags because a second chance was given to food. And because this place takes a second look at this food, it gives it a second chance, we get to look at people that otherwise might be overlooked in the community, might be forgotten. 
we get to take a second look at them and see the value of God in each person, no matter if they have a job, a house, or a car, whatever they can offer us, we give that person, by the power of Jesus, a second chance. And the most beautiful thing is, is we get to have love for people that we don't even know. They get to see value in their own life that otherwise they might think the church doesn't love them. You know, oh, the church is judgmental. The church doesn't love the community. The church doesn't care. They're about buildings. They're about money. No, no, no. Jesus loves you. And I want to give you a second chance at life and show you that he loves you. And I could give you the stats. I think they were up there, two million this, two million that. No, the best stat is that we get to look at people and give them a second chance. And Jesus was the master of giving people a second chance. You know, who needs a second chance? Do any of you need a second chance? I need one like every single day. I guess I'm the only one that raised my hand. I'm the only one that needs a second chance. You guys are all, you're perfect, right? Of course. No, but I think I need one every morning. The scripture that his mercies are new every day, I believe that was written specifically for me. You know, God had me in mind that his mercies were new every morning. But here, Jesus was the master at taking a second look and seeing value in people that no one else saw. You see, I want to share with you a story in the Bible when Jesus rose from the dead. At least one person, I might tell you a story of three people, but at least one person that Jesus saw, and that first one is Mary Magdalene. Do you know Mary Magdalene? Do you know who she was? Well, if you don't, Mary Magdalene had been a Christ follower. She would followed Jesus for approximately three years. And Mary, um, the Bible says that she was delivered of seven demons, and she followed Christ. Now, no one truly knows what that means, but I I think we do know what it means. She had a hard life. She struggled. She had skeletons in the closet. She had seven demons. What what, what would, for what? No one knows, but she was a woman who struggled. And Jesus had now died on the cross. He was buried in the grave, And Mary shows up early in the morning. She's crying. She's looking for Jesus. Because, see, for her, Jesus was everything. You know, she was the type of person that would have been overlooked by everyone, that no one maybe would have saw value in her, but Jesus saw value in her. She, She was there looking for him. And she shows up, and she sees that the grave is empty. It's empty. And so she's scared. Jesus is gone. Her, Jesus, the one that she followed, she saw him brutally murdered on the cross. And now they've obviously stolen the body or something. And so she's weeping. She looks in the grave. She sees nothing. Peter and John show up. And Peter takes a look. John takes a look in the grave. He sees nothing. Peter, he's, he looks in the grave, and he runs straight in, and he sees nothing but grave clothes, and John follows in behind him, and Jesus is not there, and they don't know what to do. In fact, they're all scared, so Peter and John, they leave, but Mary, she stays. She stays. She's looked once, and in John chapter 11, excuse me, chapter 20, verse 11, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she stooped down to look into the tomb. She takes a second look. I think that's very important. She doesn't just look and leave, but she takes a second look. And when she takes a second look, she sees two angels clothed in white, one at the head and one at the feet where Jesus' body had been lying. Woman, they said to her, why are you crying? They've taken away my master, she said, and I don't know where they put him. And she said, and as she said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus says to her, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? You know, she guessed that it was the gardener, it says. Sir, she said, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him away. Mary, said Jesus. She turned and spoke in Aramaic. Rabbanai, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, said Jesus. 
I haven't yet gone up to the Father. But go to my brothers and sisters and say to them, I'm going up to my Father and your Father and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and told the disciples, I've seen the Master, and that he had said these things to her. This is amazing. Mary, she didn't leave, but she took a second look, and she stayed. And when she did, Jesus showed up. Do you realize the first person to ever see Jesus was Mary? Do you know the only reason why we know this? It's because of Mary's testimony. The woman who had seven demons, the woman who was overlooked, the woman that no one cared about but Jesus saw value in, we are reading her live testimony of her experience with Christ because Jesus saw value in her, but it wasn't just that as well, but Mary stayed and she kept looking for Christ when she couldn't see him, when she couldn't find find him. She didn't just run off and leave like Peter and John. No, she stayed and she took a second look. And I'm wondering if there's anybody here today that you feel like Christ has been far off with you from you at times where you've gone through the struggle that maybe today this morning you would take a second look at Jesus and he might show up and remind you who he is today that he would breathe new life into you can you see yourself through Mary's eyes can you relate to her you know the interesting thing about Mary and about women In the Bible, you know, women were marginalized in the Bible. In this day and age, a woman's testimony was not respected in court. Yet the testimony of Mary is written in our Bible that we get to read. Because Jesus doesn't discriminate against men, against women, or age, or status, or country. He doesn't care what country you live in. He doesn't care what family you grew in. He loves you. Can you see yourself through Mary's eyes that each one of you is a beloved son or daughter of the Most High King? No matter where you're from, even if you're from Florida, he still loves me, okay? Here's the thing, though. Mary was the first evangelist because Jesus says, go tell your brothers that I'm alive. The first preacher of the gospel was Mary. I'm going to go a little deep today, okay? Do you know when the first sin was committed in the Bible? It was by Eve and then Adam in the garden. But Adam, he said, oh, it wasn't me, it was her. He didn't, he could have said, hey, I'll take the blame. But he didn't. The first one saved by Jesus, was a woman. Where at? In a garden. She thought Jesus was a gardener. Jesus did what Adam couldn't do. He said, I'll take the blame for her sins, for her, her seven demons, your demons, your sin, my sin. Jesus said, I'll take the credit. Where people overlooked a woman, Jesus saw tremendous value in her. You know, no matter what anyone might say about you or think about you, in the eyes of Jesus, you're his beloved son. You're his beloved daughter. You know, do you realize that we go through life, we ask each other these questions, what do you do for a living? You know, what do you know? What college, university did you go to? Because we're so interested in what we know and what we do. And we come before God and we try to impress God with what we know and what we do and who we are. And we come to church and and we, we hope that we're good enough, that we're holy enough, that we didn't make too many mistakes last night or this week. And that maybe if we can just sneak into church and just forget what, what this week was like or last year was like, that maybe we can feel good about ourselves and good before God. But you know, God isn't really that interested in what you have done, whether good or bad, or what you know or how smart you are. Because God just loves you for who you are. 
In fact, the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but will have everlasting life. And then it goes on to say that God did not come to this world to condemn this world, but they might have life through him. So before you were born, before your mistakes, before your grandparents' mistakes, Jesus died on the cross for you because he loved you before you were born. You are his beloved son, and you are his beloved daughter. He doesn't want to condemn you. The Bible says he wants to heal you. And why is this so important? It's because the enemy wants the exact opposite. He wants you judged by your actions because he knows you're going to mess up. And if he can get you to mess up, the one that's tempting you to mess up is also going to be the one that's going to accuse you of how stupid you are because you messed up. Isn't that, isn't that, a, isn't that funny? Hey, Matt, come, come day, do this. Come make this mistake. It's great, Matt. This is the enemy. It's wonderful, isn't it? You make a mistake. Oh, how dare you for making this mistake? How foolish are you for making this mistake? The same one that tempts you is the same one that condemns you. But Jesus came to set us free from all that. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen? Come on. I'll tell you one more. And that's Peter. You know, quickly, Mary Magdalene was the first person that Jesus ministered to. The second was Thomas. Do you remember doubting Thomas? He said, Lord, if, if he's real, I've got to see his hands. I've got to put my hand in his side. I've got to touch the side of Jesus to believe he's real. And then Jesus showed up for Thomas. And he said, hey, Put your fingers in my hand. Put your hand in my side. In fact, I'll just finish with Thomas. You know, what's interesting about Thomas is the disciples were gathered together, the Bible says, and they were terrified. They were behind a locked door, and Jesus walked through the wall into the room. They couldn't believe he was there, but the one that wasn't there was Thomas. Thomas wasn't there, so when he showed up later, Jesus was gone, and Thomas was full of doubt. He was full of doubt. But he didn't stay uh, in his doubt. Do you, do you struggle with doubt ever? I do. I do. You know where we tend to doubt ourselves? We tend to doubt in two ways. Am I good enough for God to use me? Like, I know that Pastor Andy, he's super holy, but I'm not. I can't, I can't, I can't be like that. John, leading worship, oh, he's holy, but maybe I can't. We doubt, our, we doubt God's love for us, and sometimes we even doubt that God is real. And what do you think God thinks about that doubt? Do you think he's upset? you think he doesn't like it? Well, this to me proves that he knows that we doubt, and he'll meet us right where we're at. And he wants us to be honest. You see, Thomas, he didn't just doubt and leave. Do you know what Thomas did? Is he came back the very next week and sat in the same room one Sunday later, seven days later. He's there in that, upper, in that room. They're having church. This time they're not scared because Jesus showed up last week, and he's going to show up again this week. Come on. And... He's standing there, and Jesus shows up, and he looks at Thomas, and he says, oh, I hear you've been doubting, right? Take a look at my hands. Take a look at my side. You see where they put the spear in here, where the blood and the water flowed out? Yeah, I see it, Jesus. You see, Thomas just didn't take his doubt and run away and go hide, and that's what the enemy would want us to do when you're doubting, when you're struggling. He wants you to disappear from this place. If you could just forget about church, you'll feel better. No, no, you come back to this house, you come back to this place, and you know who's going to meet you here? 
Jesus is going to be, meet you here. You know what's going to happen? People that love you and know who you are, they care about you, they're going to meet you here. With Jesus' smile on their face, they're going to hug you. They're going to love you. They're going to pray for you. They're going to help you walk through forgiveness and all of your struggles and receive healing and connect you with your purpose and move you forward. Why? Because we know here at this church and in this house and as believers, we know that we all have fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. And come short. And we all need grace. That's the kind of house this is. The testimony that I heard of the healing that has happened in this house, that people have come in broken and have have been raised up and left whole and healed. That's the kind of church that you're in. And that's the kind of church that Jesus wants. And let me close with this simple story and a prayer. Um, We had a pastor over at our house a few months ago. And my daughter has one of those uh, hovercrafts. Do you know what that is? It's the things with the two wheels, and the kids can stand on them, and they can rock back. Do you know what it is? Yeah? Okay. And so they kind of hover around on this wheel. And uh, I would never try it because I think I would probably, you know, break my leg or something, right? And, but my daughter, she loves this toy, and she flies around the house. She's 12 years old. And this pastor we have is about 10 years older than me. And he says to me, hey, I can do that. And I was like, no, 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 Pastor Randy, you, 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 can't, you can't ride the hoverboard. I don't want to, you to die. You're supposed to preach tomorrow at my church, okay? And I don't have a message prepared, so I need you to stay alive so that you could preach tomorrow. And he goes, no, no, I'm, I'm really good at this. I have two of these. And we're like, I'm, I'm trying to talk him out of it. And so I don't remember who asked this question. It might have been me in, in the panic. But, hey, hey, Pastor Randy, can this device take your weight. It's a kid's toy. Can it take your weight? And Pastor Randy's like, oh yeah, it can take my weight. I'm like, no, no, no. Look it up real quick because I don't want you to break my daughter's toy or die. And, um, And so we look it up and unfortunately it took his weight. And so I'm just holding my breath like, what is gonna happen? And he gets on this thing and he's flying around the house and we couldn't believe it. Can it take your weight, Pastor Randy? (laughs) Yes, it can. And you know, I think this is the question that so many of us are asking God. Lord, can you take my weight? Can you take the weight of the burdens that I carry? God, can you truly redeem my life? Or do I have too much weight? Do I have too much wrong with me? Do I have too much baggage? Mary Magdalene must have been asking the question when she met Jesus, can you take all seven of my demons? Can you take my weight? And the answer to the question is yes. He can take your weight. The weight of the world's sins laid on Jesus' shoulders as he was nailed to the cross and he was buried in the grave. But the thing is, The weight wasn't enough to hold him down. The Bible says that he rose again, and he has forgiven each one of us. For those that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you take a second look at Jesus today? Will you look full? In his wonderful face. I love the song that says, And the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. He can take your weight, but will you take a second? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Thank you, Jesus. I love this beautiful country. When we, we came here for the first time, we just, we just kept looking everywhere. The beautiful green hills, the ocean, the animals. It all speaks of the nature and the presence and the majesty of God. And every time we'd look, we'd feel healing rise up in our hearts. We'd feel the beauty of God's grace on our life. We'd look at the ocean and you'd see the the vastness of the ocean. And when you take a second look at God, you can see the vastness of who God is. Our great and mighty God. 
when you see the sun come out of the clouds, you take a second and it's like, where have you been? And that's what it feels like when God shows up and calls you by name. Mary. Ethan. Matt. It's like the life and the presence of God shows up. And the trouble that has consumed our hearts melts away. Will you take a second look at Jesus today? In fact, we're going to read a prayer together. Billy Graham Salvation Prayer. And if you'd like to pray along with us, you can look up at the screen. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior in your name. And everyone said, Amen. May I pray one more prayer for you today? Father, many of us have given our lives to you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, that he's around us, that he's amongst us. But Lord, you are also in us, each one of us. Lord, that you would fill us afresh and anew today with the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit that you would breathe new life into us yet once again, that we would be mighty men and women of God. That we would go back to our schools, back to our jobs, back to our homes with fresh life. In Jesus' name. And Lord, if anyone here today is going through struggle, going through depression, going through anxiety, overcome by grief or guilt or shame, that in Jesus' name, they would see the forgiveness and the healing of God right now. And Lord, you would break the chains of the enemy that are on them right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you for that, Lord. If you agree, just say amen. Hey, thanks again for checking out the Hills Church podcast. Hey, if this message has inspired or encouraged you in any way, why don't you share it with a friend? Hey, as well as that, we meet every Sunday at 11 a.m. at the Waterside Theatre, and we'd love to see you at one of our services. But hey, thanks again for checking out the podcast. Why don't you subscribe to our channel?